Thank you. Is this sound? Yes, great. Now this, yes, also. Okay, good. I should not have worn a woolen sweater while being on stage, I now realize. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you all for coming. I, um, so I don't really remember when, when for me it was the first time, but I've heard this saying that, that everything is connected at several points in my life. And although I don't want to debate whether or not everything is connected, I have noticed that connections can really be found everywhere. You know, connections are part of us, of the world, from connections between people, uh, within nature and language, with, within culture. And, and, and you know, some, some are literal connections and others connect us across time, while others only exist through the meaning we as humans give them. And in these days when more data is being collected every day than we could ever hope to explore, the variety in connections being gathered is opening up the possibility to display more of these often complex networks. So I've been focused on visualizing data for several years now, and I like to take on the bigger data sets, those that have a lot of diversity so I can show context and other stories besides the main insight. And ever since I started freelancing in 2017 under Visual Cinnamon, I, I noticed that a lot of my projects can be seen as revealing connections. Some very obvious, some more subtle, some ending up as actual network visualizations, while others need a different visual form to best display the insights. And during this talk, I'd like to take you through my favorite connected projects to reveal the ugly truth that grows into creating these, these big and complex and often interactive visuals and stories. So I want to start out with straightforward connections, literal lines that are being drawn, and only through the lines do the connections even exist, constellations. So being officially an astronomer, I have a very big bias for anything space. I'm often inspired by space for design elements in my visuals, but I also find myself creating a visualization about astronomy every once in a while. And so for my final addition to a year-long collaboration called Data Sketches that I did with Shirley Wu, there were 12 projects. Each project had a different theme. And for the last one, I had to make it about astronomy. So the topic was myths and legends. And through a winding road of ideas, I eventually thought about you know, the myths and legends in the night sky. Because sure, I can pinpoint some of my favorite constellations. Uh, but those were all from Western culture. And I thought, you know, what if other cultures across space and time, what have they seen in the same scattering of stars? Are there certain shapes that almost every culture identifies with? And so I drew this little sketch in my notebook and that tiny little sort of circle and in my head would eventually become something like a, a full sky map being inspired by the amazing sky maps of the old days, but also incorporating what we know now in you know, these days. Uh, and so full of enthusiasm to get started, I, I went online hoping that diverse cultural constellation data would be available for free, of course. Thankfully, though, I quickly stumbled upon Stellarium, which is uh, a great free planetarium software. And even better, it's open source. So they have, you know, they share their data. And after a, a little digging around, they, they had constellation information for 28 different cultures, probably more by now, from Chinese to Korean to Mayan and, and ancient Egyptian and Hawaiian and Belarusian and a lot more cultures. So that was great. A little bit of data preparation to get it into the shape that I wanted it to. And uh, I went online. I, I hate starting with like a blank page, like even the page, but also like a blank sort of coding thing. So I, I create all of my visualizations using D3.js, which is a JavaScript library that has become basically the standard in, in online web-based data visualization. And I looked for some examples just to get started with, and these are some of the things that I found. And the code for that was pretty straightforward. So straightforward that I thought I'd copied it correctly, plugged in my star data set, and then everything would work on the first save and reload. But of course, real life happened, and all of my stars appeared across the line. <laughs> Looking a little bit better, I figured out my mistake. And then they did appear all over the page. But you know, having my confidence deflated, I wasn't sure if that was just also a random scattering in some way or the actual formation of the stars. So we just started adding things that would add contact, like a background grid seemed to make sense. And then the lines of Western con uh, constellations, which I'm familiar with. And then I immediately noticed Orion, which is my favorite constellation. Everybody has a favorite, right? 
<laughs> Great. <laughs> Uh, and this is, in essence, a sky map, but a very boring one, though. And so I started adding things uh, to make it one based more on reality, like giving the stars a certain color based on their temperature, giving them the, the, the right radius, like a background streak for the Milky Way, but also remembering what I liked from those historic sky maps, like the all of the embellishments and the zodiac signs and the degrees and whatnot, and I'll spare you the details, but at the end, I sort of have made this into my base sky map. And what would make this kind of different from your typical star map would be the inclusion of many constellations at once. I decided I would focus on one star, and then I would reveal all of the constellations that used that one star. Of course, some of the other stars are used multiple times as well, so I started out by drawing these sort of little donut shapes around all of the stars that were being used in all of these constellations giving them these, these sort of little colors, one for each of the different sort of cultures. And then I wanted to draw parallel lines running between them, one for each of the cultures. And what I usually do in these sort of geometry-based math things is that I draw out my desired end state in my little notebook, and then I try and deconstruct it in terms of its sort of mathematical functions. But in this case, that wasn't really getting me anywhere until I thankfully remembered that um, besides sort of calculus and geometry, there's also linear algebra and the normal vector Save me eventually. <laughs> Anyways, it, it, normal vector makes it very easy. So uh, making the parallel lines come, come to life also actually didn't take that long. And then here is sort of the final main visualization of that, that project, where it shows all of the stars that use the star Betelgeuse. And when I first saw this, I thought it was so cool to see that so many of these cultures use that same sort of hourglass shape. But of course, everybody sees something different in that, from, from objects to mythical heroes to just you know, kings and, and, and animals and non-existing things. Uh, but there are also some cultures that see a very different shape, like the old man from the Tupi, which uses so many more stars, or, or this one as well from the Egyptian, which is also a much bigger sort of human shape. Lots of humans in here. Looking at the brightest star in the night sky, though, I found Sirius. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of constellations, which I think is because it's so bright and the stars around it are not. There, there's not really one clear shape, it's just that one star. I also came across this deer-like looking constellation that I still hope to find whenever I maybe end up in the southern hemisphere at some point. And what seems to be the shape that is, you know, identified the most across cultures, sometimes even multiple times per culture, is the one that we know as the Big Dipper. A very, a very clear pattern. And I turned all of that into sort of the, uh, an article to explain sort of what I found in the stars and to reveal how basically different people, different cultures have seen connections in the night sky. But I think when most people think about connections, they think about family ties. You know, how are you connected to your parents, your grandparents, and so on? And for another project in that data sketches collaboration, the topic was presidents and royalty. And I've always been intrigued by how intermarriage the royals really are, coming from Europe, of course. You know, are they our cousins twice removed, or is it farther or even closer than that? And I didn't just want the last few generations of one royal house so I could create something standard looking like this. No, I wanted as many connections as possible, you know, across royal houses, going back as far as I could find. And I was in luck again, because I found this genealogy data set of 3,000 people connected to all European royal houses and going back more than a millennium. It, it was on this amazing looking website. <laughs> I definitely learned during this, this collaboration that website design says nothing about the quality of the data it shares, so you have to look through that. It was from 1992, so I did have to spend an evening on Wikipedia adding you know, more generations in the main line of succession, and looking up some other famous royals. Uh, but the, the prob problem that I have with these highly interconnected networks is that it is very hard to draw anything less abstract than just circles connected by lines. And that is because the best way to visualize a network is so inherent to the actual connections within the network. And so what I do instead is I just kind of plop all of the data on my screen and continue to design with code to, to see how I can untangle the network. Because as it usually happens, when I do this, if I, if I plot my data on the screen, something like this happens. Like it just kind of blows up. I, I might add a little bit more sort of gravity to, to, to pull it back together. But then I get a hairball. 
not very useful. Coloring every by the year of birth helped not that much. Um, but then, with, thankfully, in the browser, you can play with the laws of gravity. So I pulled the web apart by year of birth, which was better, but it was still a rather uninsightful bundle. And at this point, I'd already invested several hours in playing with the network settings, trying different kinds of connections and, and adjusting my data, and I was really ready to you know, just give up. I couldn't find insights and, and try a different angle, like you know, how much are the royals spending these days? Always a topic. And, but I, I gave it one last shot, and that's when I decided to focus on the current royal leaders. So I placed these in a line, and then I let the vertical gravity of everybody else depend on uh, you know, who you were cl most closely related to. And that's when I finally saw it, insights. For example, that actually the late Queen of England and the Queen of Denmark and King of Norway are heavily interlinked, but the Prince of Monaco lines separated from Europe over 200 years ago. And only once I started to get a handle on sort of the story, the insights, did I really start caring about the design aspect. And like I said, I have a bias for all, all things space and networks remind me of constellations, so I turned everybody into uh, like a star. That's really the only reason. So here's the final result, rotated 90 degrees to better fit a typical screen. But because I wanted people to understand the connections within this network, I added two types of interactions. For example, you can hover over anybody and see how far six degrees of separation reaches into this web, which for this lady, Paulina Wurttemberg, um, I believe she is called the grandmother of Europe because she is connected to six current royal leaders in only six steps. Uh, but we can also click on anybody, such as you know, the, the late Queen of England, and I believe she's here somewhere. Here we have Sissy, and she's their sh shortest path. Which, for these two, you know, they're not that close to you, lady. You have to go back sort of in time again. I still have to fix that. Um, but uh, it's probably closer than any of us are to Sissy. Well, most of us probably. But the, the, you know, the late Queen of England, and let's see here, we have the King of Norway. They really are like cousins once removed or something. Thankfully, though, in the last 100 years, the royal houses have started to separate because they learned that incest is not good for the health of your offspring. <laughs> so I was connected to the Guardian US by a mutual friend. And through the Gates Foundation, they have an entire section on their website that focuses on homelessness in America. And for one of their flagship actually pieces um, about how homeless people were given single-way bus tickets to leave, uh, they were looking for outside help. They'd been requesting data about these bus tickets from cities and shelters for over a year, and they were looking for someone to bring the insights to life through visualizations. And because I knew that was too big of a job for me alone, I asked Shirley Wu, who was my partner on the Data Sketches collaboration, to help me out here as well. So, all of these, well, with my data science background, I, I kind of took all of the data analysis and cleaning on me. <laughs> and of course, all of these cities and shelters, they'd send over PDF files and Excel files, all completely differently formatted, of course, so that was already a joy to do. But I definitely needed an existing city for each of the destinations of the bus tickets. However, this was all, most of the data was very manually typed in, so there were a lot of typos. And therefore, I had to create a, a set of sort of fuzzy text matching techniques that would try and find the actual city in cases when an exact match against like an official data set of US cities wasn't found. And I made sure to sort of manually check all of these automated corrections to see if they were okay. But I also spent hours on Google trying to find the actual cities in cases when even the fuzzy matching wasn't able to figure it out. And that's how I have realized that the US should never have created four states that start with the letters MI. That's years of my life. No, not years, hours, thankfully not years. So after all of sort of the data cleaning was done, the analysis part began. We had 35,000 journeys. You know, what did these trips tell us? I, 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 looked, I made all of these sort of simple plots looking for trends and patterns. What about age and gender? What about big versus small cities? What destination was most popular? What if you try to account for distance? But simply visualizing all of these 35,000 journeys, I knew would become an important part of this story. But just plotting them as lines on the map, that just wasn't working. So I knew that needed a different kind of visual design. Well, partly due to lucky timing, everybody involved in the story could be in the same room together for two days, during which we figured out the whole story to tell the different conclusions, and Shirley and I thought about sort of the, the data visualizations that could help and explain all of these conclusions from the data. 
And my main visual would be that map of the US with these, with these journeys. And I realized that instead of showing them all at once, I had to make it animated. I had to sort of show these journeys going from their origin to their destination. Kind of like these little streamlets moving from start to finish. And then over time, these sort of circles would grow on the map to show how many of the homeless had gone there and how scattered they were actually going. So back home, I started working on the animation. And of course, you don't have like the final thing working on the first go. So there were some funny sort of in-between points where everything started and ending at the same time. You refresh the page, and suddenly you have all these little US's growing into the bigger one. OK, well, <laughs> maybe if I give everything the same speed. But then there were these sort of shock waves going across the US, not a good metaphor to use. <laughs> And then again, refining that a little bit more, uh, using an actual time scale, and then things started to look a lot better already. But I was kind of wondering, you know, if I was now doing animation, well, how would these arc arcs look if they were animated? Would that be better? So I, I sort of went into a tangent along the arcs. Of course, um, I didn't get that working on the first try either. But then once it was animating, it was clear to me that, my god, this was such a, uh, such a mess. This is so unclear, and, and you're not really sure what you're looking at. I made them short arcs which I didn't like more than the streamlets. Also, it seemed like some people were moving through Canada to get from A to B, which also was weird. It's these small things, right? So I threw the, threw the arcs away and sticked with the streamlets. I tried to do more. I just wanted to do more, like uh, being able to follow a person for a little while. I tried all of these different things, but eventually we, f we decided that, you know, just showing these journeys was already enough, just showing all of these homeless people moving across the US by these places that wanted them gone, basically. And oh, I, I, I practice this. How, they don't allow eye framing, so let's see. <laughs> um, so here's the final article, uh, and we can see the map here. And um, what is happening here is something in the DataViz community we call scrolly telling. Um, where the, the visual stays in place and it changes depending on the text that sort of you know, moves across it so that they're in sync. And here we have that animation uh, starting. And uh, yeah, so the, really the point of this visual became to show just, just that there were so many people moving across the US, so many of these homeless people, and that they were going to places all over the US. Uh, and there are many more visuals in this story, you know, as well as videos and photos and, and interviews to really try and find a good balance between these very personal stories, but also the high level insights that this very rich data set gave us. So now I want to look at the connections between the many different cultures that we have on Earth. So, since 2003, UNESCO has been gathering and safeguarding an ever-growing list of intangible cultural heritage, which can be anything from practices, knowledge, and skills that people see as being part of their cultural heritage. And about 40 new elements get added each year, and I think the whole list might be near just over 700 by now. And you, you can browse the list on, in this not-so-very-inviting table on the UNESCO website. And if you click on any of these things, you can get more information, you know, videos, photos. But there's something else here in the lower left that's probably a little bit hard to see, but they're called concepts. And they're basically the equivalent of tags. So experts of these cultural elements have extensively tagged each of them. And then if you look at these tags, these concepts, it's, it's no surprise that some of these tags occur for more than one element, such as vocal music being a part of all of these except for one. And one man within UNESCO had a, had a vision where people would truly be able to see and interact with these connections to understand or get a sense that two cultural elements could be very similar based on the number of shared concepts that they had, even though they were from totally different places on the planet. Well, he'd convinced management to give him some funding. He hired someone for the back end. And then he emailed me to ask if I was interested in doing the visual side. And he was very upfront in his first email. So at the time, there were about 450 elements, some countries, regions, World Heritage Sites are often connected to cultural um, sort of festivals and things as well, and about 1,000 different concepts. And together, that creates about 2,000 nodes, which is more of the technical term for entities within a network. And between them, they shared a whopping 12,000 connections. And I had to admit that I honestly wasn't sure if I was, would be able to untangle that. You know, with the, the royalty visit that I showed before, that was 3,000 nodes and only 4,500 connections, and that already was too much. 
However, like the the not so long working freelancing person inside of me was like, UNESCO is, is probably one of the dream clients, so I just, I'll say yes and then let my future self figure it out. <laughs> I've done that before. Uh, and uh, you know, as, as with the royalty project, I also skipped the sketching phase. Usually I sketch out ideas, but here again, this was a network, and so I had to plop all of my data on the screen and then continue to see what happened there. And as I totally expected, I ended up with hairballs. Giant infectious disease-like looking things kept appearing on my screen, no matter what I tried. However, there was one thing that saved me. Not all of these connections were of equal importance. If we go back to the concepts, there are actually primary concepts and secondary ones. And for example, for the tango, it has primary concepts of dance, instrumental, and vocal music. And it has a lot more secondary ones, such as choreography and emotion. And although UNESCO didn't want to aggregate any of these connections away, they were okay if I sort of created the network, placed the network by only using these primary connections. And so I temporarily filtered out anything that wasn't either a cultural element or a primary connection to a cultural element. And then I read it, the algorithm, and I saw this, uh, where all of the, like the yellow is the cultural elements and all of the other dots are some form of concept. And when I saw this, it looked a lot more ordered. In fact, I, th I thought I could see communities, which would be a great way to sort of create more, to untangle it a little bit further. And in, in network analysis, you talk about communities when you have groups of, of circles of nodes that are more highly sort of connected to themselves than they are to the rest of the whole network. For example, an obvious one is typically anyone's LinkedIn network. You have a big cluster of high school friends and university people maybe and different work locations, but they're only loosely connected to the rest of the network. Well, thankfully, smart people have you know, written algorithms that can find these communities, and I can then use that information to color each of the communities differently, for example, which is what I did here. Uh, just a basic rainbow color scheme for now, but I was definitely seeing these sort of communities. We had green here, then we have sort of a lilac over here, a big one, and then they're darker purple over here. So that was, that was, that was, that was good. But you know, I thought, well, these, these, these concepts, I also want them to have to create more of a visual diversity. And so I thought, I'll make the ones that are used often, the, the more important ones in a way, stand out. So I scale them by how often they are used, so how many cultural elements have connections to these concepts. But there was more that I could do. I mean, this was even, there's a lot of overlap, but besides that, generally with these network algorithms, all of these circles get placed randomly on the page when the network sort of algorithm does its thing. And then you kind of hope that it, it knows how to untangle itself. But sometimes they can kind of sort of get sort of caught up in themselves because there's just too many. And I thought, well, I, I know that these communities, they belong together. So what if I say, instead of starting out randomly, I'll place all of you in a circle on top of each other, and then I will let the network algorithm start and do its thing. And when I saw this happening, I saw that really most of these circles stay really close to that initial starting point, only some of them are drawn out more towards other places because they have more ambiguous connections. But that really showed me that looking at this particular network from the angle of communities was a great fit. Well, it was time then to put everything else back into place, all of these, these sort of secondary connections that I'd, that I'd filtered out, first placing them in sort of the average location, running a second network algorithm to place them according to all of their connections. And, and you know, going to a different sort of color scheme, using different kinds of symbols for different things, like regions, world heritage sites, these kinds of things. And I kind of liked how, if you zoomed in, that it reminded me of like a schematic look of outer space. And then my, my client at UNESCO started calling it the constellation out of, out of his own. So of course, I didn't object against that. And now with the, with the circles figured out, it was time to look at the lines, how to handle 12,000 lines visually. I generally just don't like straight lines and, and gray lines, so I made them curved and colored. But yeah, 12,000 lines at full opacity, that's not going to work. <laughs> and so again, I had to play around, see what, what I would do. And I eventually landed up the idea that, you know, when you hover over a circle, I want to see all of its connections. I'll make the primary, primary ones thick and the secondary ones thin. Um, but if I don't hover over anything, I really, again, want to see the primary connections, the most important ones. But of course, the client wanted more. They wanted it that if you'd hover over a region, it would show you all of the countries in the region and all of the connected elements. 
uh, if you had to sort of send a query to the visualization, uh, which would then fix itself. And then if you just clicked to fix one of the nodes, you'd still have to be able to hover over anything else and see all of their information. If you'd zoomed, it would have to be zoomed and pan around. If you'd zoomed in far enough, it had to show the photos inside of all of these circles. And then somehow, if you clicked on something, sometimes it would also have to show like an, a way that you could see a pop-up on another click. <laughs> and this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, <laughs> I feel like you have similar experiences with different planes. <laughs> but let me just show you kind of the idea of the final network. So um, let's see, we can go here, and I can just kind of randomly pick, you know, something here like uh, Suvora Folk Fest in Pernik region. Well, apparently that's connected to wedding and a horn, that's interesting, and feathers and food and idi idiophones. I'll, I'll take feathers. And you can, what else is connected to feathers? Like we can see it's uh, the craftsman sip, uh, maybe I shouldn't pronounce these things. Uh, <laughs> that one seems interesting. Uh, well, this is apparently connected to trees and drama and rituals and uh, costumes and, and sort of that's how this, well, apparently it's a lot about ritual dance, and a lot of things are uh, connected to ritual dance. And that's kind of how this network tries and makes it a little bit more fun and, and tries to invite you to kind of serendipitously move across this, this sort of whole field to see how everything is kind of closely related into in, in only a few steps. So I'm quite glad. I mean, it was a, it's one of the most complex sort of um, interactives that I've made, but I'm, I'm really happy with how open-minded my, my the, the team at UNESCO also was in, in being able to, how to handle this data set and how to make it sure that it, it didn't end up at a hairball, but actually seemed sort of, uh, sort of interesting and insightful. And now I want to look at connections within language, in, in sentences and similarities within sentences. So for the past few years, Google News Lab has been asking data visualizers to create data-driven stories using Google's data. And I've been happy to already create one of them about the most single translated word. Uh, and they, I was really happy that they reached out again to me to ask me to, to do another one. And so I started thinking about ideas, and I had a few, but there was one that really stood out to me, and, and thankfully also to my contact at Google, doing something about pets. So having these two cute little fluff balls, they're much bigger now. Um, in, my, in my house for the past year, I, I found myself on Google quite often, you know, asking why this, why that, why, why, did, why the boxes, uh, why do they do this? And I thought, well, how, you know, how do people in general use Google to better understand their pets? And so the concept was that I would get the most popular questions that ask why about their cats and dogs. You know, why do cats, why does a cat, why does my cat? And then a few more variations of this, and then the same for dogs, and look for differences and, and trends and patterns. And my main approach, and so this is what I do, this is usually what I do in terms of sketching, I sketch out the ideas. Uh, this is as rough as I'm, like as, how do you say that? As uh, pixel perfect as I make it, uh, and then share with my clients because I don't want them to think about what color blue, I just want them to think about uh, what the idea is. And I wanted to make this sort of uh, a sentence tree where I would break apart all of the sentences and, and sort of build it back up again based on their similar words. And let me try and explain that a bit better though. So eventually I got about 2,000 of the most popular questions that people ask about their cats. And then I said, well, you know, give me everything that has the word like as the first word. You know, why do cats like or similar things? Like it was in a smaller set. But even within this, there are three questions that have the word boxes in them. Why do cats like boxes? So I can combine that one one step further. And I can do then do the same to all of the other other words and all of these these sentences. And I have I can build up sort of the original sentence again by following a line from left to right, such as why do cats like their Bum padded, <laughs> back slap, butt smack. My God, uh, why do cats? Why do cats like to go into the bathroom with you? Yes, I do know about that one. Uh, and there, <laughs> there are some very interesting things in here. Um, but this takes up a lot of space, and so I thought, well, I want that to be closer to the sort of the word. I want them to be circles, and then also scale them according to how popular that that that, that question was. So, the why why do cats like boxes is much more popular than why do cats like milk or shoes. But this was one just one small aspect of the whole data set, and I wanted to visualize all 2,000 questions at once in one giant tree. 
And so I started again very simply with my basic network. I added the lines. I thought maybe the distance can be determined by like how many words I am into the sentence. But I also really had to increase the size of these circles because I wanted to place as many of the words inside the circle so it would become a lot easier to understand what you were actually looking at. However, now it became almost impossible to see the connections. These, these gray lines, they were just kind of blurs going outward. It was completely unclear who the parent was of any of these circles. There were just too many things going on. And that's when I started to try and find any way to make these connections clear. Who is the parent circle? Who is the child circle? Um, like grouping all of the sort of the circles that belong to exactly the same parent, but then it was still not clear who the parent was. And I would sometimes get the weirdest things, like I still do not know why these circles start rotating. <laughs> I, would, I, I think it has to do with some, some sort of random thing in the code because I would just undo and redo and then it would stop. But yeah, weird. I would draw, have like these bigger ideas. I would draw them out in my notebook first to see if they made sense, like packing all of the children of the one parent into one giant circle so you would only have one line between parent and child, but that was just not looking good. I would get chaos from time to time, which was fun, but not very insightful. And I tried, I don't know how many things and ideas to make this network insightful. In the end, I even made it just draggable. I was like, fine, if I can't program my way to it, I'll just drag my way to it. And so I made, it took me about two hours to do the right-hand side of this. And I took a step back and looked at it and thought, no, that's still not it. It's not, it's just, it doesn't speak to me as if it's inviting to actually want to explore this network. So 40 hours after having started with that initial network, did I finally throw in the towel and felt like this is not the way. But of course, this was a paying client, so I had to come up with something. Well, with the idea that I wanted to create this one giant sort of tree, sort of you know, closed off, that wasn't it, I, I looked back at the things that I had done in all of those 40 hours to see if there was something that I could use as a new seed of a new idea. And then I remember thinking that at one point I'd basically cut all of the connections to the central cat circle so that each branch would be its own mini tree. Like, like, which we already saw before, but there's also meow and need and lick. And looking back, I kind of, well, yes, that didn't, also didn't go right in the first try. But I also, I, I kind of liked how these smaller trees looked. They were very kind of cute and insightful and, and made much easier to read. And so I thought, well, maybe, Maybe I can have like a page, like a screen full of these mini trees. I'll, I'll put them in these giant circles and place the circles on the screen, each of them housing a mini tree. So I have like a, like a little formula to figure out how big the circle should be. I place them randomly on the page. Then I have like this non-overlap that tries to push everything away. And then at the end, I, I basically run a separate network algorithm within each of these circles. These are, here are some of the bigger trees to make these, these mini trees. And here are the rest. And when I saw this, you know, I was, I was probably biased after 40 hours of, of failure, but I finally felt like I'd found a good middle ground between being able to give people access to all of this, this data, all 2,000 questions, uh, while not being too overwhelming, I think, to a viewer, especially when I then also considered the design further. Like, I made it, I used a very whimsical color scale and, and, and like sketchiness to really make it fun to actually move your mouse over this and explore what it has to, has to say. Why did my cat lick me in one spot? And there's also like, oh, it's a good paw, that's a nice one. I think, uh, sniff something, that's very specific. I lick back with their mouth open, yes, they do that. I, 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 I looked that one up uh, <laughs> because my cats did that. Why did cats stare at you? They're also very good at that, but anyway. Um, so, but then of course, this wasn't the only visual on the page, so the whole process started again with other visuals. Uh, I, I tried, I don't know how many color palettes and, and, and font choices. I had to create the layout of the full page, and I'm, I'm, like, a, I'm like a data scientist turned data viz designer, so HTML and CSS was not, is not my, my strong suit, so that was a thing. Um, there had to be different kinds of interactions on desktop, on mobile, because, you know, Personally, I'm really happy that we have smartphones, but like as a data viz professional, I'm really not happy that we have smartphones. <laughs> it's like, yeah, so much, so little screen. Um, exploding the underlying sort of code, and then like an interactive search box had to be added anyway. So again, let me just show you the final result. Uh, let's see, we'll go to cats. 
And well, I didn't. I thought well, starting out with an, that entire network as the first visual is a little bit too much. So I'll start slowly with some simpler visuals, like you know what do cats like and dislike. The whole cucumber meme thing was a big thing that people searched on. You know why are cats afraid of cucumbers? And you know the sounds that they make and the licking and biting and eating. And if you you know if you've stayed with me until here, you're finally ready for it all. And like here here's it all. And you can also search for things like one of my favorites is why do cats eat? Oh. God. Too bad. Eat fake Christmas trees. <laughs> I didn't know that was a thing. And uh, you can also, I like, you can look at the same data set in different ways, ask different questions. Like, what is the difference between uh, what people ask about my cat versus a cat? Which is also interesting. Like, things that you would only realize if you have a cat in your house, like smelling and throwing up and drooling. These are things you ask about your cat, but not in cats in general. Uh, and of course, cats versus dogs. And dogs do win a lot. We wouldn't say that from like the number of cat videos, but dogs definitely win. Uh, yeah, also the biggest project that I've ever worked on because this data set was just so much fun to work on and, and tease out and, and make into visuals. Uh, and thankfully Google was, was, was you know, along with the ride. But there are so many different ways where you can find connections. There are connections in the way that an organization is built up. There are different kinds of connections between people besides family, like friends or lovers. There are you know, connections within how a, an operating system works with tasks, calling other tasks and failing tasks and things like that. Dif you have connections across time, like visualizing all of the fights that one character of Dragon Ball Z has appeared in. I like doing these sort of very nerdy side projects. Um, if you want to talk about Dragon Ball Z, astronomy, card kept us a crew, I have like, visuals on all of them. Um, and what I've definitely learned about <laughs> visualizing connections is that they, they require a very creative and iterative and especially custom approach to, to best display the insights. You know, sometimes you can have connections that are so straightforward that you can draw out like a simple design beforehand like I did with the constellations, but usually the, the connections are so, so elusive and unknown and complex that there's Nothing else for me to do but just plop all of the data on the screen using the most basic network settings and then continue to design with code uh, to, to see how my sort of design choices affect the network as a whole until I can finally untangle it and find the story that it has to tell. Well, you can find a lot more projects having to do with connections than these on my, on my portfolio. Um, I'm on X and Instagram. Uh, but if you really want to follow me these days, the newsletter is probably the best way. Uh, and finally, thank you very much for your attention.